Welcome back to Plug Life Television and part three of the Balancing the Grid episode of What Barriers Balancing the Rapid Charge to Electric Vehicles. Over the last two episodes, we've looked at how the national grid can cope all year round with every single car in the UK being fully electric, and it can do it with very little difficulty. But this time around, we're going to look at the technology that can be used to stagger the charging of every single car in the UK so that the grid isn't tripped by everyone plugging in at once. In parts 1 and 2, we learned that there is more than enough energy on the national grid to meet the demand of every single car in the UK being switched to electric, and that's whether it's in the middle of a brutally cold winter or a typical sunny summer's day. But how will we organise the staggering of electric vehicle charging to prevent too much demand being applied to the grid at any one point? First up, let's look at home charging, for which there are two very attractive solutions. The first is smart charge points, such as the My Energy Zappi which is arguably the leader in this field. It measures the output of any home renewables, such as solar panels, measures the power demand from the house, and pumps the difference into the car. So for example, if your solar panels are producing 4 kilowatts of power, and your house's appliances are using 1.5 kilowatts between them, then 2.5 kilowatts of power will be fed to your car, out of a typical maximum of 7 kilowatts for a home charger. This means that no power is being drawn from the grid whatsoever, thus allowing the household to be self-sufficient. Furthermore, good smart chargers can read electricity tariffs and use electricity only when it is cheap, unless the driver requires a top-up in a hurry. A great example of this is Octopus Energy's Go tariff, which gives EV drivers 4 hours of electricity at 5 pence per kilowatt hour overnight, when demand on the grid is low. In this scenario, the smart charger will refrain from charging the car during the day during the standard electricity tariff and start charging the car overnight as soon as the cheap off-peak electricity tariff kicks in. This way, EV drivers are financially incentivized to use self-generated and off-peak electricity, and therefore help to balance the grid. Octopus are also pioneers in bringing dynamic electricity tariffs to the UK market. These tariffs track the wholesale price of electricity, so at peak times tariffs are expensive, but at off-peak times tariffs can be very cheap. In fact, when there is excess renewable electricity on the grid, drivers on dynamic tariffs are even paid to charge their cars. Take this hypothetical example. At 6pm, most electricity is being provided by thermal plants, such as gas and nuclear, and grid demand is high, so electricity is expensive. Our smart charger has held off from charging the car at this moment in time. As the evening progresses, demand starts to fall, and so does the output from thermal peaking plants. Simultaneously, wind power starts to increase. The dynamic electricity tariff continues to fall, but the smart charger holds out, knowing what's coming next. By midnight, the driver would only have to pay pennies to charge their car, but even better, at 2am, output from renewable energy sources surpasses grid demand, driving wholesale prices negative, so drivers are paid to charge their car. The smart charger duly kicks in and starts charging the EV. This has already happened on multiple occasions in the UK, including during the day on days with low demand and high renewable energy output. Equally, these negative electricity prices could be used to pay you to charge your home energy storage battery, do the laundry, run the dishwasher, run a heat pump and so on. Workplace and destination charging can take smart charging to the next level with a dynamic load management system, such as the 20 bay destination charging hub installed by Swarco and Boyd Brothers in Green Market Multi-Story Car Park in the EV capital that is Dundee. This allows more charge points to be installed than the local grid would otherwise have been able to cope with. To give some background, let's first look at conventional dumb charging. If all the bays are occupied and all the cars start charging at maximum power, then the power demand quickly exceeds the supply for the site, which trips the grid. Now let's look at the same scenario with dynamic load management. The system features an intelligent master unit that monitors the available grid power and the power demand of all cars connected to all charging sockets. Users can specify if they are in a hurry, or if they will be leaving their cars on the charge point for several hours. The master unit then distributes power in the most time efficient way between all of the charge points, without overloading the local grid. Those who needed a charge the quickest will return to a full car, just as they would have with a conventional dumb charger. The master unit continuously monitors power being drawn by all of the charging sockets, and redistributes power accordingly to give everyone a full charge in a fair time. Rapid charging also needs to be taken into consideration, not least since rapid charging sessions can draw tens or hundreds of kilowatts of power. There are already several locations that have taken into consideration their impact on the grid, 
including Dundee City Council's flagship charging hub at Princess Street. This site features a shipping container that has Second Life Renner Zoe battery packs stacked on top of each other. These give a total capacity of 90 kilowatt hours and a 60 kilowatt peak power output, and can be charged via the grid or by the hub's solar canopies, saving solar energy for when it's required. Finally, vehicle to grid technology means that EVs aren't a burden on the grid, they actively help to balance it. Vehicle to grid chargers let an EV owner power their house using their car. For example, in the evening, during peak grid demand and high energy prices, the EV owner can use their EV battery to power their house, which not only reduces peak power demand on the national grid, but safeguards against the most expensive electricity prices. Overnight, during low grid demand and cheap electricity, or potentially even electricity that dynamic tariff customers are paid to use, the vehicle to grid charger charges the car, providing the cheapest or most profitable electricity possible, which can then be used to power the house during the morning peak, drive to work and back, and power the house again in the evening. Rinse and repeat for ultra cheap utility bills. Some people may worry if this extra battery use would degrade the car's battery quicker, but WMG conducted an extensive study that put batteries through simulated EV and vehicle to grid usage patterns over multiple years and multiple simulated environments from across the world and found that vehicle to grid use actually extends a battery's life by about 10%. This is partly because vehicle-to-grid loads are far more gentle and predictable than EV drive cycles, which have harsh acceleration and regenerative braking, and partly because the battery spends less time sitting at 100% state of charge, since it's getting regular use. So, in conclusion, when it comes to whether or not the national grid can and will cope with all of the UK's cars switching to electric propulsion, the answer is a resounding yes. So there we have it, not only is there enough energy produced by the national grid within a 24 hour period to meet all existing demand and also the energy requirements of every single car in the UK being switched to electric, but there are loads of really attractive technological solutions that mean that we're not going to see a surge in demand in the national grid that trips it because too many cars have tried to charge at the same time. Vehicle to grid in particular is really exciting. The, the fact that you could be paid to use excess renewable electricity that the grid would otherwise not have been able to cope with, and that would have resulted in wind farms being paid to shut down, for example. You're using renewable energy that otherwise would not have made it onto the grid. And then, in the morning, you're using that to power your house, which means that you're not using gas-fired electricity from a peaking plant. That means that there's less fossil fuels going onto the grid, there's less demand, that gas-fired peaking plant is not going to run at as high a power, or maybe even not even run at all. So you are not only using renewable electricity that otherwise would never have made it onto the grid, you are stopping fossil fuels from making it onto the grid in the first place. And that is a really exciting development. And as I said, you are potentially being paid for it on some days and other days you are saving tons of money because off-peak dynamic electricity tariffs are so cheap. And that is definitely the way things are going. The one bottleneck, the one thing that's holding us back at the moment is that there are some substations, not the national grid as a whole, but some substations which were designed decades ago. They were looking at you know, when the national grid was a centralised setup with lots of big coal or nuclear power plants that were then sending electricity to households. They're not designed for electricity to flow back the way. So we've already seen some situations with universities or industry who've tried to install, for example, big solar panel arrays and the distribution network operator that runs that particular substation, that tiny wee bit of the national grid, has said, ah, sorry, can't do it. That substation is also not due to be upgraded for a few years. So I would hope that those substations will start to be replaced quicker. The government needs to realise that this is the one bottleneck that's stopping us from being as green as we possibly can. And then hopefully there'll be emergency money set aside so that those substations can be upgraded as soon as possible. So even without that, though, the grid can cope and the grid can be really green. But the future could be even greener if we have that full capability. So I'll see you again soon for another episode of Plug Life Television.